Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Intellectual Forum at Jesus College. Tonight, we join you from the Sibylla Room, uh, named after a nun, because indeed there was an abbey here long before there was an all-male college, um, and one of the nuns in that abbey was a nun named Sibylla. And so in reclaiming the history of the college, this room um, was named in her honour. Um, welcome also to the fourth in our series of six events on death and dying, um, where we've been taking a range of perspectives on this topic. It comes to all of us, death and dying. And I have to say, I've been truly moved by the intersection of personal, professional, intellectual ideas that have fused in the three events we've had so far. The questions from the audience have just been outstanding and the level of engagement. We've looked at palliative care and the difficulties of accessing it. We've looked at digital immortality and new ethics, new considerations for the possibilities of life beyond death in the form of remembrance and continuation. And just Last week, we explored the very delicate subject of what, in fact, is a good death and the realities of facing end of life. And I'm sure uh, tonight will be no different. And I'm delighted to say my co-organizer, Dr. Ben Barris, is um, going to introduce the panel and moderate this evening's um, session on multi-faith perspectives on end of life care. Ben is a, a clinical community nurse researcher, highly awarded for his work on palliative care and has been a, um, a key driver in helping to shape this series and open up this public conversation because indeed that was the aim of holding this series. So I hope you enjoy tonight's event and I'll hand over to Ben. So well hello everybody. Um, can I do a sound check at the back? Can I... Brilliant. So welcome. Um, before we go on to talk about multi-faith perspectives in spiritual care at the end of life, I just wanted to sort of segue the importance of this debate today. Um, there's certain things in British society we don't talk about, and death, politics, and religion are pretty much out there. <laughs> Although politics has seemed to have gone, gone into conversation much more now. Um, and, and really, the conversation today is based on conversations we had about wouldn't it be brilliant to really understand more about how spiritual care is provided and perceived. And speaking as a clinician, it's one of those things that we're not quite sure how to tread water sometimes. We also, what things also cross over between different religions. I think that when death really approaches, some things merge um, and some things are different. So I'm going to announce our three speakers and then invite them to come and speak in turn. Um, and then we're going to have a facilitated discussion. So first of all, in the order of speakers, I'm going to just give a brief uh, bio for everybody, if that's okay. Margaret Doherty. Uh, Margaret is Director of the Centre of Art of Dying Well at St Mary's University, Twickenham, in London. Um, orig originally, it was an initiative there for, for the Catholic Bishops Conference of England and Wales. And the centre where Margaret's based is been there since 2018 at St Mary's, and he's turning research into tangible action as one of the principal ways that the centre pursues its mission. Um, next speaker will be Emma Harris, and she's the Director of Development and, uh, and Alumni, I can never say the word, Relations at the Wolf Institute in Cambridge. Um, Emma manages the Diversity and End of Life Care Training Programme, and led the development of the Wolfson Institute publication, which is an excellent publication, Diversity and End of Life Care, a handbook for caring for Jewish, Christian, and Muslim patients. And then we well, would like to welcome Dr. Syed, Syed Makish, if I said your name correctly. Okay. <laughs> um, dyslexic pro mistake. Um, and Syed studied in Bosnia before obtaining a BA at the University of Wales and an here at the University of Cambridge before going on to do his PhD at the University of London. He served at the Imam Im Im in Mosque in Bosnia and in the UK, and currently is at a mosque in the, um, the, the Cambridge... Uh, Central Mosque. Cent Central Mosque and Cambridge Muslim College. So thank you. If I could invite Ma Maggie Margaret to come up. Thank you, Ben, and um, thank you for coming here this evening as well. 
and uh, thanks particularly to Eleanor and to Molly um, and Charlotte for, for all their help as well. It's been a, a joy to work with everyone. Um, and I'm sure some of you have already watched um, the, the other wonderful um, lectures, talks uh, in the series. And I was struck when Professor Stephen Barclay at the, the very first um, seminars said that many of us in this room have recent or previous experience of death and dying. So if anybody needs to step out at any point, please do, please feel free to step out. Um, so I'm going to look at different themes this evening. We've each got 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to look at humour. I'm going to look at accompaniment, remembrance, rituals, and practical considerations for healthcare settings. So I'm going to begin with humour. I used to be a press secretary to a cardinal, somebody who I loved very much. And he, he loved working in the media. And um, this was a pause for thought that he gave on Radio 2 with Chris Evans uh, 10 months before he died. He didn't know he was dying at the, to at the time. So he said, there was a very old priest and he was dying. Around his bed were a few young seminarians, that is priests in training, looking very recollected and prayerful. The old man looked up, opened an eye and said in a weak voice, open the drawer at the foot of the cupboard, which one of them did. And when he opened it, in the drawer was a bottle of champagne and some glasses. He was told to fill them up, which he did, passed them around and then wondered what to do. The old man opened his other eye and said, what about me? <laughs> so they gave him a glass. Then he said to them, I've lived a very happy life. I want you to drink with me to a happy death. And five minutes later, he died. But you see, he'd spent a lifetime coming to terms with the old enemy, death, and did not fear it but in some way embraced it. And then the Cardinal went on to say, you may say, why is the Cardinal talking about such a gloomy subject? Naturally, most of us in some way are in revolt at the prospect of dying. We put it in the back of our minds. And then he said, but I want to say to you two things. Firstly, I believe in the value and dignity of every human person, and that means you. And secondly, I believe that everyone is lovable in the eyes of God. In spite, in spite of all our weaknesses and failures, God loves us, and so death must be of a peace with life. With the help of God, I hope I'll be able to face it, not with fear, but with hope and confidence as being in the hands of God. And so 10 months later, um, I got a call uh, that the Cardinal was in the Marsden, and I thought, well, I've got to go and buy that bottle of champagne. So I went and bought the bottle of champagne and I went to his wards and I said, you've had a happy life. And he said, Maggie, put it in the fridge <laughs> for now. We're, we're not going to have it quite yet. But, but he did. Um, he, he, he died in the September of, of that year. And so it was great that we had that, that pause for thought before he died. Um, Humour, as we know, helps with easing tension and anxiety and also to celebrate life and joyful memories. And also it helps maintain a sense of normality and humanity. And from a Christian perspective, it reflects on the hope of eternal life in Christ. As I explained, in addition to humor, I'm also going to speak about accompaniment. And I know that that was something that was brought up in last week's discussion. I'm also going to touch on remembrance and to look at some of the important rituals and practices that shape the, the end of life experiences within the Christian and the Catholic faith tradition. The Christian tradition of accompaniment is rooted in Christ's example of walking with others in their joys and sorrows. In the context of death and my, dying, this means being present with the dying person and their family, <laughs> offering spiritual and emotional support, praying with and for the person, and is ensuring that they don't feel alone in their final journey. The Centre for the Art of, we rename now, We're Living and Dying Well, has trained over 300 members of a volunteering charity, the SVP, uh, to become end-of-life companions, who then go on to be companions in their local church, their, co their care home, or join the volunteering programme after an interview process in their local hospital if 
um, the hospital has an end of life companionship program or a hospice. Schemes in hospitals, hospices and community settings have been developed and evolved according to local needs and common themes run throughout compassionate person centered support offered by volunteers in a way which is complementary to the to the care of the healthcare professionals and family and friends. And in the sessions that we run, which are over th three online sessions, participants learn something of the understanding of death and dying in our post-pandemic society. They reflect on how it is to be alongside a dying person and what are the desirable personal qualities for companionship. One key message is that you're not on your own. The church, the parish community is with you. And what about remembrance? All over Europe and in South America, All Saints and All Souls Day, 1st and 2nd of November, are celebrated with visits to cemeteries and by special commemorations in churches to remember the dead. All Saints Day is marked as a special feast day. In many churches, it's customary to have a book of remembrance in which people write the names of their loved ones to, to be prayed for, especially during November. All Souls Day and the month of November are significant times of praying for the dead, and it's a tradition to offer masses for the deceased. Finally, on to rituals and practices. I'd like to explain some key Catholic rituals and practices related to death and dying. The anointing of the sick, uh, final Holy Communion, the sacrament of penance, prayers for the dying, and the importance of sacred space and symbols. Um, as we know, there is significant diversity with, within Christianity and individual beliefs can vary widely. Common Christian end of life practices include prayer, reading scripture and singing hymns. And prayer is a significant spiritual practice for many Christians at the end of life. It can provide comfort, strength and a sense of connection to God for dying patients. As I mentioned, the Catholic Church has three sacraments for people who are dying, the anointing of the sick, the atticum, and the sacrament of penance. The anointing of the sick, well, what is it? I, and I'm sure many of you know, a priest anoints the sick person on the forehead and hands with olive oil that has been blessed. As he does so, he says, through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who frees you from sin, save you and raise you up. It does often bring peace of mind. This does not mean that the person who receives the sacrament will recover, though it's perfectly possible that the peace of mind they feel afterwards contributes to them living longer. And the main purpose of anointing, as with all the sacraments, is to make Christ present in the situation. Viaticum, food for the journey. The second sacrament given to the dying is called viaticum, food for the journey in Latin. Viaticum is Holy Communion, the bread and wine that Catholics believe becomes the body and blood of Christ during mass. This spiritual nourishment takes on a special significance when someone is dying. A priest, deacon or Eucharistic minister may bring viaticum to the dying person. Finally, the sacrament of penance, life review. The sacrament of penance, also known as reconciliation or confession, is usually associated with the dying. In this sacrament, the person relates their sins to a priest who gives them absolution. This means that he forgives the person's sins in God's name. There is also prayers for the dying. Even after all the sacraments have been celebrated, there are still important prayers that can be said to support those who are dying. And after death, even in their shock and grief, the family will want to pray for the person who has died and for each other. And if possible, call the priest to pray with them at home or in the hospital. And to Catholics, very often the crucifix, holy water and the rosary are very often held very dear. The key points uh, would be to call a priest in good time and for the priest to be able to give the three sacraments of anointing of the sick, viaticum and penance. And I mentioned also that I would look at the practical considerations for healthcare settings. 
Uh, one, uh, one thing is for patients and or their families to th let the hospital know that they are a Catholic. It's important that people let the hospital know and also to ensure access to priest deacons or Eucharistic ministers and to accommodate requests for religious items or practices. Um, my centre, uh, we, we train seminarians every year in their first year of training uh, to be able to deal with death and dying early on. So that's a palliative care physician, a priest and a funeral director. So they learn early on about the natural process of dying. They learn how to listen well. They learn what morphine is and what it isn't. And also they learn about that very special relationship with the funeral director how, and how it's important to get it right early on. And they also learn what it is to be a priest by the bedside. And also in that training, very early on, they learn of the importance of working with multidisciplinary teams in the hospital and also to be there for staff, because each day we know that staff have to go through a lot. And so early on in the priestly training, they learn that they're there not only for the patient and their family, but for the for the wonderful staff that are there to support them. Thank you. <laughs> To begin by thanking Ben, Eleanor, Molly, and Charlotte, and also my fellow panelists, it really is it really is a great honour to to have been asked to to be here this evening. So, as Ben said, I work at the Wolf Institute here in Cambridge. The institute was established in 1998, and we're an interfaith institute specialising in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Through research, education, and public engagement, we seek to better understand these faiths. Okay build trust between people of different faiths and increase understanding and cooperation in society between people of faith and those with other beliefs and worldviews. For more than 10 years, our religious diversity in end-of-life care programme has provided training for healthcare professionals and volunteers who care for the dying in hospices, hospitals and care homes. The programme aims to empower clinical and non-clinical staff to enhance the quality and impact of the care they provide to patients and relatives. By undertaking training, they can become more knowledgeable and confident, offering care, empathy, and compassion to Muslim, Jewish, and Christian patients who are approaching the end of life. And this is achieved by staff better understanding the religious, social, and cultural practices that surround death and dying. The accompanying handbook, um, we have a few copies here today if anybody is interested in taking one and also details about the training as well. It was written with the support of medical and religious experts and developed through our experience within the training programmes, as, well as, um, as well as our research on end-of-life care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Through succinct introductions, it raises awareness of how Jewish, Muslim and Christian patients and those close to them may approach the end of life and how care for them can be sensitive and appropriate. And the handbook includes a series of case studies, which provides opportunities for reflection on best practice in end of life care. And case studies are also a key element of our training program. So I want to share with you a personal care, care study, a case study, sorry, from the Jewish perspective. In May, 2022, my mother passed away following a short illness. Within five weeks of her passing, my dad was given a rare cancer diagnosis and was eventually hospitalised. Just before he was expected to commence a months-long um, course of radiotherapy and immunotherapy, the senior oncologist gave us the devastating news that the cancer had spread rapidly and we were now looking at end-of-life care. They couldn't predict the future, but they forecast weeks, not months. Jewish tradition places a high value on caring for the elderly. Not that my dad would have considered himself elderly, but still. This may be done by the family in their home or by, by finding a supportive facility to best meet the patient's needs. Dad was very unhappy in hospital, so I sprang into action to find a suitable care home. The British Jewish community has several care homes and hospices throughout the country, and there are some well-established facilities for provision of palliative care. 
Sadly, there isn't one in Cambridgeshire and my dad was unable to travel far. So I had to ensure that the chosen care home would be able to support my dad and me with long established Jewish customs and practices. He was only there for a week before he passed away. But during that time, whilst his mind was still highly active, his speech was badly impaired. I didn't want him to suffer any detriment in his faith because he may not have been able to communicate his wishes. So I became his voice and I engaged with the care home staff who knew nothing or very little about Judaism and made decisions that rendered his last week as comfortable and as faithful as possible. One of the first things I had to talk to them about were dietary requirements. So when he first arrived, he could still eat a little. And whilst it was difficult for the care home to provide kosher food, which is a, a long story, I was able to explain to them how they could cater for him. So no meat, no shellfish, which, which fish are permitted in Judaism and the like. In other words, adjustments that could be made that would not infringe on his dietary needs and ones which he would be happy um, 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 with as well. In the Jewish faith, there is a mitzvah, a commandment that must be performed as a religious duty to visit the sick and dying. This commandment, known as Bikur Cholim, eases the patient's passage from earth into the eternal life of heaven. Visiting the sick and dying is a simple and yet it is a sacred act of kindness and compassion. Many Jewish communities will have a committee of volunteers, often as part of a synagogue, who make such visits to support the sick and dying and their families, and often the rabbi will visit. My dad had not wanted any visitors, and very few people even knew that he was ill, let alone dying. But knowing it was end of life, I disobeyed my dad's wishes, I desecrated the fourth commandment of honouring my parents, <laughs> insisting that the rabbi came to visit him. Maybe it was selfish of me, uh, maybe it was the wrong thing to do, but I wanted to give my dad the opportunity to have a moment of spiritual reflection to allow the rabbi to engage faithfully with him, something that I was not able to give him. All I could do was sit with him, hold his hand, and when the time came, recite the confessional prayer, Vidui, on his behalf, as he was no longer able to speak at all when he was close to death. This prayer allows the individual the opportunity to express regret, confess sins, and ask for forgiveness. Whether or not I should have recited this prayer, or whether rabbinic teachings would say I shouldn't have done so on his behalf, I still wanted to honour my dad before he passed away. When he passed, I had already explained to the staff that they should not wash the body. Instead, the Chevra Kedisha, the Jewish Burial Society, should be informed immediately so that they can come to prepare the body and bury according to the customs of the Jewish faith. At death, the body is handled with dignity and respect. The body should not be left alone. Many Jews believe that the soul is still present after death until burial, until the body is buried. For this reason, some people still speak to the deceased at this time. And I did spend a few moments just conversing with, with my dad uh, at what became quite a beautiful moment. Conversation near the body should, of course, be respectful and appropriate to the sacred moment. And some Jews prefer that the eyes and mouth are closed gently, hands and arms extended at the side, the jaw bound up and the body covered with a sheet. The staff at the care home were absolutely incredible and immediately covered the body to show respect to their patient. The feet are towards the door and a candle, if that is appropriate, is lit near the body. Jewish law requires an expedient burial within 24 hours of death. If the death occurs on the Sabbath, on, the, on a sundown uh, Friday through sundown on Saturday, the funeral will be held on Sunday. Of course, there can be complications. For example, if the local GP had not seen the patient in the days before death, they may be unable to sign the death certificate. And that was something that I was faced with, which I'm sure you can appreciate increased my stress levels at that moment. How was I going to manage to register the death in a timely fashion? I was still waiting for final confirmation that the certificate had been issued but I still managed to get an appointment to register the death. 
I was informed by the register office who I spoke to on the phone that a few appointments are kept aside in religious cases such as this one, where the expediency of the burial was paramount. And for that, I was most grateful. It highlighted to me that religious communities were being heard by councils and local authorities. The funeral is followed by a gathering at the family's home, which begins Shiva, seven days where mourners remain at home and, receives, and receive guests offering condolences. Services are also held, usually the evening service in Judaism, we pray three times a day. The religious mourning continues for a year and between nine and 12 months after the funeral, the tombstone is set accompanied by a religious service. And each year on the anniversary of the death, we light a memorial candle. I will end there and look forward to hearing from you all later. Likewise, if I may begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me tonight, maybe it would be better off if you read the summary from this perspective than listening to my boring presentation, <laughs> but if you can spare about nine minutes, I'll be very grateful indeed. So I was invited to say a few words about end-of-life care from an Islamic perspective, and what really stands for me, uh, this whole series has been amazing, I have to say. Uh, is two terms, end of life, so it's still life in there, and care, this term care, caring for, from an Islamic perspective, taking care of an elderly or person in need or someone dying is something truly noble and valuable, and it is a value in itself and of, and of itself. And in Islamic tradition, values always take precedence over needs or some kind of financial constraint or something like that. So what I really liked from Professor Stephen, I apologize twice now we're referring to him, in his talk when he mentioned what is an excellent physician, outstanding doctor, from a good doctor, was to look at the patient and to treat them as a person rather than treating their ailment or disease in particular. So this is what I wanted to mention right at the beginning that from Islamic point of view, we never separate a human person from three components, their mind, consciousness, and for as long as we believe that person has some degree or some level of, of level of consciousness, and I was interested to hear that in Jewish tradition, some scholars believe that the soul is still with the person in the body until it's buried in the ground. We believe slightly different, maybe for a few minutes or so, but until we are almost certain that the body is now cold and the soul has departed the body, we again treat it as we can't pronounce somebody dead, right? So there are a lot of scholarly discussions among Muslim jurists on how to define death, what is actually dead. So we see the person's conscious or mind as one aspect of our being, then our bodies, and then our spirit or soul. And the three actually always work together, and we can't separate one from the other. So I would say to a health professional or a practitioner uh, or anyone, a family member, even the person themselves, they always need to be conscious of this uh, trilogy or whatever you want to call it. They need to also see themselves as a body and as a mind and as a spirit. And every person that interacts with that person, especially when they, when they are approaching the last moments of their lives, although you can look at this end of life care differently, it's age is irrespective in a way, maybe it's not elderly, because we are all going to face the end of our life. We don't know exactly when it's going to come, and that's what Quran in a way mentions quite vividly and strongly. No matter where you are, death will touch you, even if you hide on a very, like, on a tower, right, on the top, it will come to you, you can't basically, there's no point in running away from it. So I like Scott Peck when he says, why are we afraid of it? When it's our lifelong companion, 
Instead, we should treat it as the wise counsel that we have, and it is probably the wisest counsel that we have that's literally always here. This, when it stops breathing, when we stop breathing, or when that's where it is always. Like breathing in and out is basically we're witnessing it on there at all times. But then brace it as our best friend and not be afraid of it. So the person needs to think. Uh, in a positive terms, and I also enjoyed you mentioning some humor, doing something that that can basically break the, the tension, yeah, the difficulty of those moments and those decisions and, and the news, the information that you sometimes hear when you talk about palliative care or end-of-life care. And I can tell you one, case studies I agree are the best, right? Real, I, I won't narrate anything personal, but someone that I knew personally, uh, from Cambridge University, a young girl, probably you heard of her, uh, some of you maybe, she was at Emmanuel College. At the time when she was about to receive her graduation news, that she was an outstanding student, first in politics and history, she was given the horrible news that she had a, a lung cancer at a very latter stage, third probably, <clears throat> whatever, and she was given just a few months. And her mom and dad, She's a young girl, 20, probably three years old back then. They are devastated. They can't handle the news. They find it very difficult. The Macmillan nurse is already there. And the brave girl actually says to dad, dad, it's good news. What is good, in any, if anything, in this kind of news? Well, dad, we have two choices right now. To accept the diagnosis and face it, or to deny it, or keep denying it, and then build some kind of grudge or contempt towards maybe God, if you are a man of faith, or maybe somebody else that you know, or an institution blaming somebody for that. Let's embrace it. And that's exactly what the Quran, and especially our prophet, teaches, that we accept divine destiny, divine faith, we say as Muslims, that we are all going to die. And this is exactly why I enjoy this series. And I like it because dying is definitely going to happen to all of us. We don't know how and when, and we need to face it and prepare for it. And we need to break some taboos and cultural stigma around it and realize that let us, in a way, embrace it, if possible. And how? Our beloved messenger once was surrounded by his companions. And some of them fell really ill. And they asked him, should we call a physician to treat this person? He said, yes, call a physician and let the physician do their job and treat this person. And then they complained to him about different types of diseases that we have today. We have even more than 1,400 years ago. He said, don't panic. Don't lose hope. There is no disease that God allowed or sent down on this earth that he didn't send a cure for it or some kind of remedy with it. We just need to figure it out. We need to study plants better, maybe, and, and do a better job in research, and etc. Except one, he said. What is that one? He said, aging. <laughs> There's no, nothing you can do about it. We are all going to age, right? And I like this story. He said it, and we can actually see signs of it. Like in Islam tradition, you see some gray hair or some whatever sign of aging and maturing is there. Again, you can look at it from different perspectives. In Islamic worldview, basically, you will say, yes, it's inevitable. But it's a sign of God's mercy that none of us knows the destined time or the way in which we are going to face it. That in itself is so reassuring and relieving. If we knew the actual date. My father even says to me many times, like, none of us would be able to bear it. None of us would be able to face that actual moment. But by God's mercy, we don't know. Or whatever's mercy, whosoever's mercy we think, we don't. And that's a, a, a positive thing, I would say. And then we also see it like, you see that sign. But then, like you mentioned, Margaret, I think the, the, the Cardinal's story is amazing. I had a lovely, beautiful life. Whether it was a 20 years of life, or 40, or 60, or 80 plus, and you are still a, an honorary professor, or professor emeritus at Cambridge University, or at one of the colleges, wonderful, brilliant. 
you can actually realize that as you age and gain more of life experience and you're heading towards the inevitable end of life and you will be taken care of, okay? You actually rejoice by knowing that you have gained knowledge and wisdom along the way. And this is what our prophet in a way uh, emphasized. Yes, we are men, men or women <laughs> uh, twice, yeah? We are actually once men or women, and we are child twice. This is the famous uh, proverb, American. So, in a way, he used to say, "You need to, in a way, enjoy your life as much as you can." And when you see yourself or your family members are given the news or notice that you are heading towards the end of life, the Islamic tradition would say it becomes a duty upon family members to take care of that person. And where, like it was mentioned already in the series, where somebody is going to die, it's a mystery, we don't know. But people clearly die at different places and different locations. In Islamic law and in Islamic tradition, every Muslim has certain religious duties and moral duties that don't leave them for as long as there's some kind of conscious and life in them, as I mentioned. So whether you are really ill, terminally ill in a hospital bed or in a hospice or, or at home, the obligation of fulfilling your five daily prayers is not, not uplifted from you unless you lost consciousness for an extended period of time so that the whole time of that prayer has passed. And if you were to wake up and regain your consciousness, if it was more than five days that you were not conscious, Again, you will need to make up for those lost prayers when you regain your consciousness. Even if that means you can just blink with your eye or move a finger. You might not have the strength to do other postures, but I don't know how many of you know, in Islamic uh, law again, we have five daily prayer, which is a formal prayer with very specific rites and rituals before it to prepare for it and the prayer itself and afterwards as well. So this applies to all. People who are just about to die, I visited one, for example, student of ours, and he would die very soon after that. But somehow he was sober and we could converse, and he was trying to pray, but he also had a form of cancer, skin cancer, was really difficult. But he tried, and one thing I wanted to mention with you as well is the notion of uh, purity, water. What Muslims do is we... Basically, symbolically, take we ablute before we pray, we wash before we pray. And this is a recent invention. It's called my voodoo companion. Voodoo means ablution. Uh, this is the first like is Islamic Sharia compliant <laughs> spray that you can use to basically wash certain parts of your body, as the Quran says, uh, before you are able to pray. And it's a, it's a big burden and difficulty for the hospitals and uh, care homes and hospices. To, to basically provide all these facilities for their Muslim patients because they have to pray five times a day at specific times, not of our choice. It's something to do with sun, following the sunrise, yeah, when the sun is in the middle, at the sunset, etc. Like I came straight after the sunset prayer, I have to go now soon to, to lead another prayer. So to wash probably is one of the greatest challenges uh, for someone who is not feeling well. So our Prophet peace and blessings be upon him, he told, told his companions those that felt fever or felt unwell, you don't increase any kind of discomfort uh, or, or illness to your body. Your duty and duty of those who are taking care of you is basically to relieve yourself of any kind of pain and body in your body. So you make a dry ablution. You don't use any water. Maybe it could be fatal. <laughs> And there was an incident, according to one tradition, with one of the companions, because there are two times when we require a whole full bath, purificatory bath. Okay? So there were an expedition. It was outdoors in Arabia. It was probably quite cold at night. So in the morning, for the very early morning prayer at dawn, he took a full bath and he fell ill. And then he told those who were next to him, off, the messenger like, reproached them. Why did you allow him to take a full bath when you knew that it was cold water and that he, he, he could probably die? Instead, you had to make dry ablution, which is just touching some kind of stone uh, or brick 
and symbolically close myself. Because even the bottle I just brought to, to, to display, it's symbolic. We don't have any physical impurity on our skin or part of the body that we wash, but we are about to communicate with God. So toward the end of life, that is the moment, as uh, my co-panelists mentioned, when the patient needs to be most connected with whatever divine being he believes in, whatever it is that he believes may happen next. And in Islamic tradition, Rumi is one of those Muslim mystics who said it very nicely. It's like wedding with reality, with the, with the eternal life, death is like wedding time. So it's time to, to celebrate and rejoice. And our messenger, according to many traditions, he was given the choice, angel of death came to him. Traditions say, God sent the angel uh, and giving him the choice or asking for his permission to take his soul. And the prophet chose to die. Our prophet Muhammad chose to die. And the, what he mentioned before the last few phrases that he mentioned was prayer, prayer, prayer. So praying until the last breath basically is the Islamic notion. And then he said, going to, to my best friend to the highest lofty station. Basically, he, he was looking forward to meeting, yearning to meet his Lord. So this is Islamic perspective. So too much noise in the room, wherever the person is, would be Islamically inappropriate. Instead of that, you, uh, 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 someone who's taking care of the person or the person themselves would need to know that cleanliness of the body, of the clothes, and the place like bed or the bedding, the sheets, is necessary in Islam until the very end. I wasn't going to talk about dying, death itself, and burial and washing. So this one spoke until the, the, the soul has left the body. But there are many bioethical, you know, uh, dilemmas. Of, for example, uh, when we, uh, when the health professionals administer medication, and the men would know much better than I in this regard. Um, what I could just say from an Islamic point of view, our messenger. He taught uh, his congregation or people, members, your body has right over you, your, your soul and your intellect, your mind as well. But he also told the physicians, doctors of their time, whatever level they had, it's all about trust. Fulfilling your trust, your duty towards that person and the sanctity of that life and that soul. So you know if you overdose that person, even if the person is saying, I want some relief from this pain. I cannot bear anymore. Is the doctor's conscious that he is not going to do that because he 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 is there not to basically speed up somebody's death, taking their life. He's there to prolong their life. And we I'll end here in Islam tradition believe if a person just said one phrase, "Glory be to you, God," "Praise be to you, God," just one sentence, which takes a second or two. It could be as precious as this entire world and all of its riches. So to give a patient another opportunity to say one more prayer, to kiss their loved one again, embrace them, see their great-grandchild, uh, would be very appropriate. And also our messenger would never, he discourages us to stay a long time with somebody who is in pain and suffering. So he always insisted on very, very short visits. This will help the NHS in a way, because a lot of people trying to squeeze in this tiny room or space. So like literally touch the place if you can, if it's possible, where the pain is, and make a very short kind of prayer for that person. Because we can pray from distance about for anyone and on, of any, on anybody's behalf. And those prayers will be answered. Physical contact is not necessary or being in the same room uh, as such. So it is a uh, 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 duty in Islam, but it is an honorable one, uh, and we all, in a way, maybe start with our own parents. Those are the, the experiences that we most experience uh, and that we have, and in it, is, in it uh, are great memories as well, and I'll end with this story. Uh, this uh, saint lady resisted her children from crying over her bed when she was diagnosed with terminal illness, and she insisted on keeping a smile on her face. And she didn't allow anyone to cry close to her when she was just about to die. And they questioned her, why did you do that? She was a great poet as well. She said, I want you to remember me in good shape, with a smiling face. 
don't remember me at all. If you're going to remember me in a horrible state, crying all a mess, then don't. Please remember me, even the kids. So I end here, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So firstly, a massive thank you. Three really insightful talks. And I basically, I just learned loads. You saw me take loads of notes. Um, I, I'm going to take, um, take Chair's prerogative and just bring some of it together, if I may. Um, what, what seems to transcend all three religions is the importance of prayers, customs, and practices. Maggie, you mentioned um, you're not alone. That, it strikes me that that transcends all, all three religions um, and there's comfort and strength and connection with being through, with God. And that religious practices also show compassion and the duty of the wider community and a form of community cohesion and collective support and care. Um, and I think there's an awful lot we can learn from, from religious practices across all faiths. Um, I'm going to open up to questions from, from the floor, but before I do, I'm going to take the pro to give the first question. Do you mind if I ask the three of you um, if, if you're happy to speak about, for each of the religions, um, how how after death is viewed, the afterlife, if I may? Well, actually, we discussed this. Um, we have a community theatre in Twickenham in southwest London, um, our university, St Mary's University. And we had an event uh, two weeks ago on art and the afterlife. And a medic spoke, a uh, art historian spoke, and uh, a priest who used to be a, a director of Sotheby's, not a director of Sotheby's, an auctioneer at Sotheby's. And you can tell he was an auctioneer at Sotheby's. He was always going to do the sale there for you. Um, but in terms of how it's, it's a subject, I think, that's a taboo within a taboo, uh, both within uh, the faith tradition, I would say within uh, particularly the Catholic faith tradition, it's not something that we speak of very often. I'm sure it's very different in, in Islam and, and the Jewish faith. But it, I, I think it's something we need to open up more in a way that isn't confrontational. But that's why we looked at literature, art, uh, and we just wanted to unearth um, different interpretations of what the afterlife looks like. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, it's an it's an it's an interesting question to ask, and one which I am not particularly familiar with. But I was always taught this um, this incredible story when I was at school that um, two brothers. Um, one passed one was about to pass away and said i'll let you know what it's like <laughs> um, and then when he apparently came to him in a dream said you'll understand when you get here <laughs> <laughs> and that's how i have always understood the afterlife but i i, I couldn't speak from um, from 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 a rabbinic perspective yeah, thank you. <laughs> i think it's a personal perspective is important here it's um it's a tricky question. I think I ask it because it's a tricky question. So forgive me. Yeah, thank you, Ben. So I, I, I stop more or less at that junction. So you have now uh, asked me to complete the second part. So I'll keep it short. Uh, the cracks in Islamic tradition really is that once the soul leaves the body, uh, the Islamic scripture clearly says it is not the soul, the spirit, the person that dies, it is the body. And our prophet, in a way, explained to us in his teachings that this body is just like a vehicle that transports us from location A to B. And this whole life, worldly life of ours, is like a transition. It's like a bridge opening this side of the door and exiting on the other. So uh, the Quranic perspective really is that after the soul has left, uh, we still basically, the soul can hear us and we can communicate with that person and pray on their behalf and pray for them, uh, but we cannot hear them. So this is Islamic perspective. And uh, as my colleague Emma said, in, in Islamic tradition as well, 
it is encouraged, strongly encouraged to close the eyes and also the mouth and to untie any knots that are on there and also to cover the face with a cloth un until the wash, the actual ritual of washing is there and also to let the hands spread uh, by the body with arms opened up as well, if possible, remove any kind of jewelry or anything uh, that's on the body and then hasten with uh, I mean, as soon as we in England, for example, as soon as we get the death certificate, if the coroner is involved, uh, Islamic position would be to honor this person who just died, uh, not to have anything very invasive, if it's not necessary, if the circumstances, I think CT scan, now they have actually something called medical uh, examination, I think in place by legal, so it's not necessarily very... It, they are trying, they are learning and also using the latest technologies available yes. so that they don't uh, actually you know harm the body or do anything to the body unless it's very necessary yes. so this is what we would like expect as a muslim person or a muslim family so that the body like emma said is also uh, discharged from the hospital at its earliest possibility and then transferred to let's say a local mosque or a mortuary somewhere there and the preparations for the wash, uh, the, the ritual of washing are taking place. At that, at that junction, uh, we emphasize again, pure water, the symbol of purity and perfumes, different scents, nice scents, where we perfume the body, clean it and do the same ritual or that we do before the prayer because we are going to say the funeral prayer, the final prayer for that person on their behalf, but they can't move their limbs. Mm -hmm. So we perform that ritual on their behalf by washing them and preferably wash the whole body, cut their nails, shorten their hair and make them look very nice and, and, and presentable. And then we hasten, if possible, to bury the person because what was made from clay, as we believe, should go back to it. Uh, so we don't believe in cremation. That would be like is an Islamic, illegal, unethical as well. Um, so uh, once the body is buried, this is my experience being an imam as well for almost 20 years, more than 20 years actually, the family of the deceased, they relax. There's a different vibe. But then the bereavement process starts and we give condolences, Islam, strictly speaking, in Islamic tradition for three days and nights. If you, for whatever reason, didn't manage to send your condolences to the family, you don't remind them necessarily of somebody that died from their family in that particular wording that our prophet recommended. We have wording in the traditions, which are sound. But our messenger told us, like I mentioned, you know, remember me with a smiling face as I'm about to die. He also said, never ever remember your like dead relative or someone that's died, it doesn't have to be related to you, but somebody that you knew with anything uh, that they wouldn't be happy to hear when they were alive. So basically, Islamic tradition says, you remember that by their good virtues and characteristics and traits and never speak of anything ill that they did, even if they, if we know factually they did something, a crime or or something indecent or immoral, in, maybe in our uh, moral compass. So we all remember them and we remember them in some tradition, if possible, every day and behind every five daily prayers, but following from Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition, seven days and 40 days and then annually, is very common across the Muslim world. But the scripture encourages us to remember our dead uh, people, teachers, anyone that we knew as often as we can, because there's an admonition in it for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all three of you for asking what was a tricky question as well. Okay. Um, let's open up to questions, uh, both in the room and by Zoom. So colleagues on Zoom, do you put questions in the chat? We'll bring over a mic. And you don't like starting by your name. Uh, my name's Mark. Um, I noticed that the title, oh, thank you to the speakers, has been very interesting. Um, I noticed the title was Multi Faith Perspectives on Spiritual Care at End of Life. Um, my role is I work for Sue Rider Hospices and I'm responsible for spiritual care across the hospices. And I was in an MDT yesterday and the vast majority of the patients put down that they were non religious. And so I would like the speakers just to explore this issue of spiritual care 
when we're not actually talking about religion. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've known people say, would you like some spiritual support? And someone will say, no, I'm not religious. By spiritual care, we're saying it's when people are trying to make sense of what's happening to them as they're coming to the end of their life and how it's affecting their relationships so their sense of meaning and purpose in life and saying goodbye. So I wonder if people could just reflect on what spiritual care means, not, not in the sense of religious prayers and rites, but in terms of helping people, I won't say come to terms, I don't like that kind of finality, but to make sense, make their own sense yeah. of impending death. Could the, the sense of spiritual well-being as well as it's achievable. Yeah. Would anyone like to answer? I, I think you've given quite a few hints for, for how I can. Mark, thanks for coming this evening, and uh, and I'm sure really you're the expert in in this. Um, um, in terms of um, as it's always coming from where where a person's at. So so one, they might not want to talk at all about it. But two, it's I think um, if somebody's open to uh, talking about their life in terms of if the, if they want to talk about their family or their friends or their achievements, that aspect of life review in however a gentle way, I think, sorry, it's the, you can't hear, Just oh, apologies. It's on, it is on, but is that better? No, apologies. Is that better? Better. Yes. Sorry. Um, so in terms of that uh, gentle way of entering in, into a conversation about a person's life so that they get the opportunity at, about speaking about their joys, their hopes. And also very often it's it's about wanting to see that person that they, they may have a, not seen for many, many, many years and that they want to be reunited with. And it's trying to help them find a way to be reunited with that person. It's um, it's it's the beginning of a conversation. And that's actually something that my dad experienced at the care home. Um, they actually asked him, did he want to have a conversation about his life? Um, because they couldn't talk to him about Judaism since they knew very little, if anything, about it. Um, so they actually talked to him about his life and at that point he was still able to have that conversation and could still be humorous about his life, saying he'd had an incredible life um, and uh, that he now wanted to be with his wife. And that was, I think that really helped him and whether you want to call that spiritual, it, it gave him peace. And, and I think that was really important for him and it put a, it put a smile on his face, which which gave the, the care home staff um, a lot of comfort as well, that they were doing the right thing for him because he could have he could have said no. It wasn't something that, you know, it's prescribed. You have to be able to talk, you know, you have to talk about your life. But they, he really felt that that was, that, that was something that, that he could do with them. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for coming, Mark. Yeah. My one is all right. Sounds okay. So... <clears throat> Like I, I mentioned earlier, unlike Carl Rogers in, in, in psychology, it's like person-centered approach, I would say. So Islamic position also will support, like I mentioned rites and rituals, this is what religion, a religious person would want to do and, and is aiming to do. But interestingly enough, uh, like I said, I mentioned some concessions, instead of water, using water, dry ablution, Quran mentioned itself, and all the lady, you're not going to wrap somebody up. They don't need, they cover the hair, for example. This is a Muslim principle. Quran says, take your headscarf off, like to make it more comfortable to the person. So I would say overall position is to consider the individual's preferences and wishes. So what it is that the person wants to talk about, what can cheer them up in particular? Maybe you mentioning... Uh, some kind of right really you know traumatizing because they know they haven't been praying for for many years but they believe in the consequences of missing something or the vice versa the other way around so i would say uh it's this sense of compassion uh you know and uh, seeing them as, as as a whole person 
and you know like giving some credit to them for who they were and who they are um, and asking them like uh, how can we uh, like help you now and, and be at your service so it, we call it khidmat, this notion of being at service rather than exploiting something from them or seeing them as a commodity that's basically what i was trying to say like financial side should be secondary always they are a precious life still a person not even just a body where soon let's take consent for organ donations and say no that it would be unethical and not in line with our tradition thank you thank you um i think it's something that hospices particularly excel at spiritual care um, and it's it's wonderful as a, a model to learn from um, in other healthcare settings. Um, I met a lovely professor, and he, he he described he was a theologist, and he moved into he was a gerontologist as well, and he described it to me as an act of care, and it's just giving people the space to tell their story. Mm, um, and I thought, yeah, you nailed it. And in the same way as you've all nailed it as well, it's what's going on there. Yeah. Um, can we open up to Molly for Zoom and then next one in the room? That's all. Thanks. So this is a Zoom question. Um, the Church of England provides at the time of death the three sacraments mentioned by the Roman Catholic panelist, Maggie. What work is being done ecumenically to educate and extend awareness of these provisions across Christian denominations? Thank you. And do we have the name of the person that also it's Mother Catherine Twining? Mother Catherine Twining. Yeah. Hello, Mother Catherine Twining. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I think much work still has to be done in the area of death literacy generally. Um, and also uh, within, I can only speak of, of, of the Catholic and the Christian tradition, that there is still a, a great deal of work to be done. And um, so how that's done um, is always begins with our friends and family and then our own parish and church communities. Um, but, but it's still a, a work um, because um, so sometimes people don't know that those sacraments are available to them and also to um, call the priest or the minister early. Thank you. Um, well, good stuff. If you don't mind saying your name first, please. Um, hello, my name is Malika. I have a general question, um, but um, more specifically to the son. Right. Um, so I work on intensive care with babies, and unfortunately, um, yes, um, in Cambridge because we're a tertiary centre, we do unfortunately see a number of babies dying. Yes, just because of the severity of the illness of being mm. born. And I know this talk is all about this, you know, people coming into terms with death and dying, um, but we are faced with parents who are faced with premature death and dying or babies who have just born into this world. Yeah. Um, so in that context, obviously, they're very much person family focused what their needs are, whether it's Christian or Muslim or spiritual yeah. needs. Um, but in sort of you know, part of end of life care is about withdrawal of intensive care treatment, um, but that causes suffering and it's alleviating the suffering, mm. and giving medications to alleviate the suffering. When we know that the consequence of that is speeding up the death process, mm. I'm particularly interested in what you said about yes. the individual the physicians, patients, when we know we are giving medications to um, speed in that. So if that were an issue in Islamic faith, how do we speak? How do we communicate that? Yes. Thank you so much. Because a fantastic question, I have to say. So recently I had a case of a family. Uh, their newborn was diagnosed or had some kind of condition. It was irreversible. And uh, so as I'm not a physician, I'm not a doctor, but as I understand, you have this no attempt of C C CPR, like you basically know that it will cause more damage to the person if you force and try to when they have a heart failure. Uh, so in Islamic tradition, basically, the individual can choose to stop taking any kind and any form of medication. 
they can like make their own free conscious choice to stop taking any painkillers and any kind of assisted treatment machines or anything uh, around it. So when you have a case like you mentioned, when it's a small infant or a baby, uh, it is the parents basically who want that child to, you know, like to continue living, but they are in, in extreme suffering and pain and they don't know where to draw the line. So, uh, I mean, we are touching on, on obviously assisted dying in a way. Uh, I would still say Islamic position is that the physician is not allowed to give more dose of painkiller or, or a drug that will harm another part of the body, another organ, internal organ. So they can give like some kind of painkiller that will help them to, to cope with that pain, but not to the not on the expense on harming another part of the body or speeding their dying uh, consciously through that medication. So it basically means uh, if uh, certain drugs are not an option, really, uh, you don't basically give uh, any drugs because in Islamic tradition, the emphasis on enduring and patience uh, is mentioned in, in texts because we Muslims believe, as Quran says, God will never impose on us pain and suffering beyond our capability of going through it, even with a small baby that's just a few weeks old. And I don't know much about the senses of pain in the skin and all that. It's subject to science, but I understand the younger the person is, they don't, they can't feel the pain. The nervous system is different. So it seems like uh, basically that the, the individual's wishes should be honored. And if it's a minor, then the parents need to be educated again and told we will not assist anybody in dying. Uh, that would be against Islamic ethics. Uh, but uh, we will do whatever we can uh, to help them make them feel more comfortable and uh, in as less pain as possible, I would say, but not beyond that. Um, shall we open to another question in the room? Um, yes, maybe at the back. You don't know if you're happy to say your name. Hello, um, my name is Jemima. Thank you very much for being here. It's been a really, really interesting discussion so far. Um, I was wondering what your perspective would be on um, a patient who's maybe non-compliant or is very, very resistant to <coughs> receiving care or treatment that would be suffering. Um, this can be particularly difficult for the family to watch you know, if someone is potentially being in denial about treatment they might need. Um, yeah, that's one of your perspective on that sort of thing. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I would say um, early on, um, the importance of um, communication skills within medical training for all, um, for nurses, for, for doctors, and for those who, who become consultants, That and, and the incredible importance of listening well about not giving a person a good talking to, but giving them a good listening to. Um, and within that also, uh, I would say those uh, who are called to ministry within their own faith traditions, that, um, that communication is an integral part of their training and also listening well is an integral part of their training. And also those bioethical questions that we've discussed this evening are an integral part of their their training because also within each congregation there are consultants, there are nurses, there are doctors who have been faced with the situations that you describe and want to be able to talk them through and, and want to know that they've made, made a sound decision um, because it tortures people in their mind uh, if they're not given the opportunity to be able to to express what they've gone through and so it and also when it comes to family dynamics it's so so sensitive um, that um, uh, the, the basis in knowing how to listen, knowing when to respond, knowing what to say, is an accumulation of, of wisdom, experience, yeah. and training. Just to add that it could also be that um, the chaplaincy uh, team may be able mm -hmm. to provide some kind of support, especially you know if there is a, the religious dynamic uh, that might actually be supportive for both the patient and the family. 
Yeah, I can just echo what Emma said. Basically, I have dealt with so many cases, exactly what you mentioned. And I, in a way, I think some of the research also indicates at least 20% of those cases are related to mental health illness, patients with some kind of underlying condition, mental health usually, uh, or of all, much older age. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's all about educating them, you know, uh, and and like I said, like talking more about that trust from either side, uh, saying that this medical professional wants best for you, uh, and they are actually here taking care of you and helping you and trying to narrate somehow that to the patient, that may them may somehow make them comply with 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 the treatment. But if they are completely refusing in Islamic uh, uh, tradition, basically we will allow the patient to refuse any treatment. Because you don't have, if you're suffering from some kind of uh, disease, it may rapidly grow. You are allowed to deteriorate, but that would be against recommendation in Islamic law. And I give you just one story. The Prophet Muhammad, on his dying bed, when he was like suffering from heavy fever, and he almost lost his conscience at some point. So uh, one of his wives and, and one of his cousins, they, they gave him, they administered some medication. They gave him some kind of painkiller, like today's ibuprofen or something, and some water with some herbs in it. And he regained his consciousness. And he said, what did you put into my body after that? And then they told him, we, put, we gave you these two. Ah, you ladies. Ah, he was just joking. He was actually joking and smiled and laughed with them. And they were laughed. And soon after that, he would die. So it seems like when the patient doesn't know what they're talking about and they are con they're making decisions which are contrary to their well-being and health, then, uh, you know, we could, in a way, like, uh, take the matter in, like, the, 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 people, the people who are responsible for them, whether it's parents or caretakers, health professionals, they're allowed basically to uh, to force the person to take some kind of medication, especially if they're going to do self-harm or harm someone else. Thank you. It's a very tricky, ethical situation. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, I, I think it goes to show the importance of the meetings of experts, you know, including the patient themselves. Mm. One more question from the room. If, uh, Sharon. Okay. Sharon, um, and I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts on how much or how little colleagues who are um, caring for people with palliative and end-of-life care needs should bring of their own belief system into their practice. Okay, go ahead and use the same order. Um, I, I think again it relates to where the person is. I, I think the, the religion, the, the faith tradition needs to stay outside of the room if the person doesn't want that. Obviously, if a person is from a particular faith tradition, that's that's within them and it will always be part of them. But but and, and one has to respect the individuality and the choice of, of the person that's before them and to care for them. As be in the, the noblest and the best way, um, and, and that's for every single individual. I don't have it. Yeah, thank you very much, Sharon. It's an interesting question, I have to say. Uh, so I would say, like, the person who comes from this angle of care, but genuinely, honestly, they could help. Okay, because they have the necessary knowledge and the patient or the person at the end of life wouldn't be really at their best conscious mind. Um, but if, like uh, my co-panelist said, if somebody demanded that they don't want any kind of right or religious practice uh, around, I think that also need, need to be honored. Even though we know the, of this person being a bishop or someone and they are you know, like used to these routines and rites. And Julian, I think, mentioned like his mother chose, coming from a Jewish background, chose not to want not to want to have any kind of religious symbolism or, or things around that time. So I think the individual's wishes and preferences need to be honored. Our tradition, Islam will say that for sure. Thank you. 
Thank you. Just a small anecdote. When my dad was in the care home, one of the cleaners would go past his room every day. And for some reason, you know, they were kind of having a really nice rapport. And she asked me, would I, would, did I think he would like to pray with her? And it was such a beautiful thing for her to say. But I had to very politely decline and say I didn't think that that he was he was in that space right now to be able to do that. But it was a lovely thing to do. Thinking of that. Thank you. It's it's a very personal thing as well, and it's hard for healthcare professionals to navigate. Um, if I can add another anecdote, just a brief one. I I have interviewed a lovely gentleman recently who's um, got a very strong faith. Um, and he said he took great, um, great consolence and, and comfort from the fact that people offered to pray with him when he was in hospital. And I was interesting because previously I thought from a different perspective of sharp bring your own religious into a place to a workplace. It's a fine balance because you don't want to get it wrong, um, and you don't want to put your own faith onto somebody else who right. may not have a faith. So. It's a tricky one. It has to be navigated very carefully. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to close close up um, and just, I, first of all, if we could do a massive round of applause to our three excellent speakers. <laughs> I, I actually genuinely have learned a huge amount tonight uh, and will be taken a lot away from my own practice. Um, just want to give a quick, well, two things. Firstly, I want to say a massive thank you to all of the Intellectual Forum team. Um, Molly, who's in the room, um, Eleanor, uh, Julian, and um, and all our other colleagues. Um, this series has been wonderful to do. We have two more events to come. All the events are online and you can access them at any time. Some of it, as today, it can be quite challenging, and we, we want to challenge and push our ideas. Um, and our next session is going to be on what lies beneath, and reflections of historical and contemporary burial beliefs and practices, and how they actually influence today. And that will be on the 18th of November, um, the web library here, 5.30 to 6.45. Thank you ever so much. <laughs>